Yes, so uh, we have a guest from Portugal, Dr. Sylvine Lanneber. Uh, sorry for my pronunciation, uh, from University of Coimbra. Uh, and the talk will be devoted to first principles homogenization of periodic metamaterials and application to artificial graphene. So I remind you the rules of the seminar. In case if you have any questions, you may either raise your hand or you may ask the question by voice, but please do not interrupt Sylvain just in the middle of the sentence. So Sylvain, please, the stage is yours. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So today I'm going to talk about first principles of homogenization of periodic metamaterials and the application to artificial graphene. So here is the outline of my talk. First, I will introduce effective medium theories. I will tell you uh, what they are, in which context you can use it, and why you want to use effective medium theories. Then I will show you that uh, local effective medium theories have some uh, limitations. And in the second part of the talk, I will present you an overview of a non-local effective medium theory that is uh, very good to, uh, for example, homogenize metamaterials and other, other systems. In the last part of my talk, I will apply this theory to the homogenization of artificial graphene near the Cape. So the, sorry. The, the context of my talk is the following. I will talk about wave propagation in inhomogeneous periodic materials. So electromagnetic or electronic, uh, for electronic or electromagnetic waves. What I will consider is some composite medium made of two or more uh, different materials. So in the context of electromagnetic waves, it will be materials with different permittivity typically. And for electronic waves, it will be uh, materials with different uh, electrostatic potential. So if you want to characterize the wave propagation in such medium, you see that in general it's very complex. So here I present you uh, the band diagram of the photonic crystal with uh, this unit cell, uh, this permittivity of the sphere embedded in air, composite medium so. And you can see that in this frequency range, for example, for high frequency, the wave uh, propagation is very complex. You have a lot of modes, very complicated. But another zone uh, area when where the, the wave propagation is much simpler is this one, when the wavelength is much bigger than the uh, lattice constant, A. So in this case, you can see here that the wave propagation is described quite simply with the uh, relation between the frequency and the wave vector, which is linear. So this is, uh, in this situation, this is like a homogeneous material in which uh, you have such linear relation. And in this case, for example, at low frequency, for sure, you can define the, effective index to the material. So this is what I'm going to talk about today, effective medium theory, uh, how wave propagates in composite medium when the wavelength is much bigger than the lattice constant. So when this is the case, what you can do is uh, spatial average the response of your material and consider your material as an homogeneous material characterized by a few effective parameters. So in the context of electromagnetic, it would be, for example, effective permittivity, permeability. And in the context of uh, semiconductors, it could be the effective mass and other parameters. So why do we, do we want to, to use such uh, effective medial theories? It's because um, it allows you, for example, it's very convenient and it allows you, for example, to find uh, very easily the band diagram. And in the C plus case, for example, the reflection and transmission by a slab. And because they are very useful, uh, these uh, effective medium theories are very old. For example, in electromagnetism, the first one in, uh, comes from this, uh, this date. It's the clausius mosotti formula. In this formula, what you try uh, at the time, uh, the people were trying to understand the behavior of crystals and they, they model a natural crystal by a bunch of uh, periodic arrangement of dipoles. Uh, described by the microscopic polarizability, and then relate the microscopic and macroscopic uh, properties of the material with this formula. So you can relate the effective permittivity with the microscopic permit, uh, polarizability. And you can see that it depends on the density of dipoles. Another very well-known uh, effective medium theory, and very old also, is the maxwell garnett one. In the maxwell garnett one, you consider medium with different permittivities, for example here, two different permittivities, and in the, when the wavelength is much bigger than the, the lattice, yeah, 
here I have no lattice constant because Maxwell Yannet can also describe when in the case of debut composite medium in the, the response. But what you can do is can assign an effective permittivity of or permit permeability, for example, with this formula. So also very odd formula. And in, in the context of semiconductors, for example, you have the concept of effective mass, which is also a very odd concept. I think it dates back, it dates back to the origin of uh, quantum mechanics. So nowadays, what about homogeneous techniques? An important event happens in the, in the 2000s, where the metamaterials uh, birth, with the metamaterial birth. So uh, with metamaterials, you can have uh, strongly resonant structures and also a densely packed array of resonators. And then there was a, uh, a need for new homogenization techniques because the old ones were too simple to uh, model these uh, metamaterials. But here you have an important limitation depending on the effective medium uh, theory you use and effective medium, uh, sorry, effective uh, medium theory that are locals and Maxwellians have limitations. So here by Maxwellian, I mean that uh, the effective uh, medium theory uh, uh, obey to Maxwell equation. And by local medium, this is what I mean. So here it's for electromagnetic waves. In the local medium, what you have is that the, 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 uh, the vector D, the electric displacement, is linked to the electric field at the same point of space. You can see here the, the D is given at R. It depends on the electric field at the same point. So it was, it's, it's why it's called a local medium. So if you uh, take the Fourier transform, you will find that the permittivity in this case is, depends only on the frequency. When you have a non-local medium, the, the relation between D and E is different. You can see it's given by the following convolution here. And you can see that D depends on the field, uh, electric field at different points in the materials. So it's why it's called non-local medium. And when you do the Fourier transform, you obtain that the permittivity depends on frequency, but also on the uh, wave vector. So this, this uh, phenomenon is also called spatial dispersion. So now, if you try to uh, model some uh, metamaterials, some specific metamaterials with a local model, it can give you unphysical response, such as uh, uh, non, non passive response, uh, non causal response. So, for example, it can happen close to resonance due to weak spatial dispersion effects. It can happen also when you extract the local, some local effective parameters from an experiment. So here, typically, it's what, why, uh, what you observe, an, an anti-resonance in the real part and uh, in imaginary part negative. And also, it can happen in the presence of diamagnetism. Another important context where uh, you cannot use an effective, uh, local effective models is uh, to describe the, the, to homogenize the wire metamaterials. In fact, it was shown uh, in, in, in some papers, uh, in particular in this one, that uh, the strong, even in the long wavelength limit, you need strong spatial dispersion to describe such uh, wire metamaterials. So here I also put you a review with it uh, recently on the homogenization of wire metamaterials. So in general, to describe uh, uh, metamaterials, for example, you need a non-local or non-Maxwellian effective models. And this is what I'm going to present you uh, right now. An overview of a non-local effective medium theory that was developed in, by Mario Silverina in 2007. An effective medium theory so that takes into account spatial dispersion, which, is, which use external excitation or initial states which is valid for frequency, and in this paper it was extended to time, uh, uh, time descriptions, to time domain uh, calculations. It respects causality and passivity. In 2012, it was extended to describe electron waves, and it was extended using uh, Schrodinger formalism. And maybe the most important Thing is that it gives you accurate prediction for uh, metamaterials, a lot of metamaterials and semiconductors uh, structures. So let me explain you uh, how these homogeneous techniques works. Uh, um, here I will uh, show you the Schrodinger implementation of these homogeneous techniques. So in the context of electronic system, the Schrodinger uh, formalism is the natural formalism. So you have a periodic medium, you describe it by this kind of Hamiltonian equation. 
in the case of electromagnetic system, you, you can show that you can put uh, the Maxwell's equations into a, a Schrodinger type uh, equation. So in the non-dispersive case, you do like this, you use this equation here. And you can show that uh, in the dispersive case, you have several papers that explain you how to extend uh, this to dispersive medium. So both your problem electromagnetic and electronic can be described by Schrodinger equation. So now how the homogenization works. So you start from a periodic system in which the modes are block functions and described by a Schrodinger equation. And what you want to do is uh, spatial arrange the response to obtain an homogenized system in which modes are plane waves and describe a, a, an effective Hamiltonian. So here you can see the Schrodinger equation. What does your Hamiltonian? It describes the evolution of the microscopic part of the, of the microscopic wave function. Sorry. What does your effective Hamiltonian? It describes the evolution of the envelope of your uh, microscopic wave function. So it's the average of your microscopic wave function. It describes. So, so, Sylvain, so sorry for interrupting. Do I understand correctly that even in the dispersive case, this effective Hamiltonian is given by six by six matrix? So because so electromagnetic waves. Yeah. I, I will show you next, so for example, in the electronic case, it can be many things. Yeah, but, uh, but in, the electro, in the case of electromagnetic waves, should it be six by six? It's a six by six, you have the, the wave, microscopic wave function here. Mm -hmm. But even in the, in the dispersive case? So. In, the, in the case of spatial dispersion? Yeah, so you mentioned that it can be extended to dispersive media, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, okay. In the case of dispersive, ah, okay, I see what you see. Uh, in the case when you write the electromagnetic uh, problem in, in terms of, uh, for the dispersive media you have, extra um, degree of freedom, which mm -hmm. optimizes the, the resonance in, in your material. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so should, should I extend the dimensionality of my Hamiltonian or there are some tricks how to overcome this? I'm not sure, in fact, because I never did that for a automatic case. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. Maybe Thanks. Maybe is here, he can, he can tell you. I mean, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But maybe not. Maybe I think you need only to excite. Uh, I will show you after. You need to excite, and I think it's sufficient to excite uh, electric. And, uh, oh, Mario is writing that six by six is enough. Okay, thanks, Mario. So, thank you. <coughs> so I was saying that the effective Hamiltonian describes the smooth part of your of your wave function. So to be a bit more precise, here is what happens. So I told you that the Schrodinger, uh, the, the micro microscopic Hamiltonian describes the evolution of your psi. The effective Hamiltonian describes the evolution of the average part of psi. But in fact, this is true only if the initial state is uh, a macroscopic state. So if you start from uh, what is a macroscopic state, sorry, it's a state which is equal to its average. So if you start with a state like this, initial state equal to its average, at any time, you have, will have this relation, the, uh, the average, uh, the, ah, sorry. At any time, we'll have the effective Hamiltonian that describes the average part of your microscopic wave function, exactly. So in order to understand what does the homogenization, I need to explain you what does the spatial average operator. So the spatial average operator is some kind of a low pass filter and uh, it, its action is completely characterized by what it does on plane wave. You know that you can expand any spatial function into plane waves. So if I tell you what it does on plane wave, I tell you everything. So when you take a plane wave and you average it, what happens if, is, if K is in the relevant Brillouin zone, you have the same plane wave. If K is not in the relevant Brillouin zone, it, you have zero. So it basically eliminates all the all the plane waves that are not in the relevant Brillouin zone. So by relevant Brillouin zone, uh, this is what I mean. In the second part, I will study graphene. As you can see, uh, the, here I represent the first Brillouin zone of graphene. But you know that the physics, interesting physics of graphene is close to the corner here, K and K prime point. So in the following, when I will homogenize graphene, I will consider the, the relevant Brillouin zone as the green zone here, centered on the K point. 
So, so Sylvain, another question. So does uh, the result of homogenization depend on the choice of the brilliant zone? So either you choose this uh, yellow no. or green rectangle. No, it doesn't. It does not depend. It will change only the the harmony yeah. you will consider. I will show you after. I will show you yeah. when you change if you change the the brilliant zone. Okay, thanks. So uh, first of all, I will show you now what uh, an, aesthetic, an interesting case. What does the spatial average do to uh, block functions? I told you that the microscopic uh, eigenmoles of the system are block functions. So uh, to characterize what the spatial average operator do on block functions, uh, I will expand it into a plane wave. So a block function is the product of a plane wave times the periodic functions. You know that uh, you can expand the periodic function in Fourier series. And then by inserting this series here, you have your plane wave expansion of the block mode. So now, if you spatial average this block mode, I will assume that the ve vector k I use here is in the relevant Brillouin zone. So what does your spatial average uh, do? It uh, keeps only the plane wave which are in the Brillouin zone. So here, this plane wave is already in the Brillouin zone. Every g will put it out of the relevant Brillouin zone. So you need to take g equal to zero. So this is the spatial average of your uh, block modes. As you can see, it's a plane wave, and the amplitude is given by the zero harmonic of your pe the periodic part of your function. So in the future, I will use this notation for the main harmonic for, the, for this, sorry. So mind that it's different to the average operator. You have brackets. Here you average some spatial function. This, this is a constant. Another interesting case uh, that you uh, you, uh, I, I will consider here it's a spatial average, average sorry, of a product of functions. So here I choose uh, uh, the product of the periodic function with the block mode. So for example, you will find this uh, when you take the average of uh, h times c. So again, to calculate the spatial average of this, you expand it in plane waves. So you already have the plane waves here for the psi, the other plane wave for the potential is this one with the Fourier transform. Like before, I choose k in the Brillouin zone. So to have my spatial average, I need this exponential to be zero. And so I need to take q equal to minus g. So what happens when you average this, uh, uh, this product? You also obtain a plane wave. But this time, you can see that you don't have only the, the main harmonic. You have all the harmonics of your potential and all the, the harmonics of your periodic part of your bulk function. So I think it's important because sometimes people think that homogenization is you only consider the main harmonic, but in fact, each time you have a product of function, you will have many harmonics. So now that I explain you how, uh, what does the spatial average, I will explain you how to calculate the effective Hamilton. So uh, to do so, we average the, the microscopic Hamiltonian, we define a new Hamiltonian like this, which is equal to this function. So to find the effective Hamiltonian, you need to express this function to put to, exp to make appear this average wave function. You can do that. It was demonstrated that you can do that. And this is the formula you obtain. So you can see here that this is not a multiplication between the effective Hamiltonian and the psi. This is a convolution. So now I can make a parallelism with what I showed you before. It's somewhat reminiscent of what happens for the definition of the, the, the electric displacement. So this formula is very important. It's what, it's what uh, allows you to calculate the effective Hamiltonian. And this is how you do. So you start from an initial state, which is uh, equal to its average. So I choose a plane wave with the k in the relevant brilliance zone. If you do, if you choose such excitation, you will find that the, the, these two functions are block modes. And as I told you before, when you average a block mode, you obtain a plane wave. Now, if you uh, substitute this expression into here, and after uh, doing a Laplace transform, you will find that this formula. And this formula you can see here, you have here a multiplication between the effective Hamiltonian and this function. So this formula allows you to calculate the effective Hamiltonian. And after rearranging this term, this is what you will obtain. So the effective Hamiltonian is given by this, two, the product of these two numbers, which are given by this. So 
for example, here you find the effective, uh, so you find the microscopic wave function for a given k. And once you have it, you can calculate these two average and just calculate the effective Hamiltonian. Now, if you have the microscopic function in the time domain, you can calculate this relation in the time domain and then Laplace transform to obtain these two quantities and calculate. So, in fact, what I just show you is um, when the wave function has only one component. Now, when you have a multi-component wave function, what you need to do is to consider uh, an excitation for each uh, for each component of the pseudo spinner, an independent uh, excitation for each component. So, for each excitation, we'll obtain. Uh, uh, you can calculate this average for each excitation and. To obtain the S by S Hamiltonian, you will have to uh, use this formula. So let me tell you that once you have the, the effective Hamiltonian can be calculated for any pair of omega and k. In fact, you fix k with, by choosing your excitation here in uh, the, your initial state. But if you want to obtain the band diagram of the structure, you can do it with the effective Hamiltonian. You just need to solve the following equation, the determinant of the effective Hamiltonian domain is this. And as shown in uh, this paper, you obtain exactly the same as from the microscopic Hamiltonian. Okay, so now I explain you how is the homogeneous technique. Now I will apply it to artificial graphene. So first, what, what I call artificial graphene, what is it? It's the following, it's a 2D electron gas, so a system where uh, electrons can move in two uh, directions. Uh, which is mod modulated by uh, uh, electrostatic potential, which has the uh, symmetry of honeycomb symmetry, like in graphene. So here I represent you the potential. I represent the two sub lattices of the honeycomb symmetry uh, lattice uh, with different colors, but the potential you apply here are the same, the two sub lattices. These are the experimental images, and these are the band diagram that was computed in this paper with Penguin method. So as you can see, you have a direct cone at k and also at k prime. So this is why it's called the uh, artificial graphene. So microscopically, uh, the, the Hamiltonian that describes the, the, the behavior of the electrons in this system is the following. So now I can show you an interesting analogy between the Schrodinger and Maxwell equations. So in the stationary regime, the Schrodinger equation uh, was like this, and you can rewrite it like this. And what you can do is compare this equation to the Maxwell equation in the 2D photonic crystals where the, uh, for T modes and where the Z component of the permittivity is uh, given by Grun model. What you obtain is the following equation. And you can see that the two equations can be made the same by choosing this uh, relation, this equivalence relation between the parameters of both equations. So if you do that, if you choose like this, you will have exactly the same equation and of course the same solution and also the same average, for example. So if I, uh, uh, um, I take the value I have for artificial graphene, I put it there, what I find is the following. You can have a photonic equivalent of artificial graphene in the photonic crystal made of earth cylinders and we did in metal. So because the equation of the same, it will give you exactly the same band diagram. And close to k and k prime, uh, we showed in this paper, for, for example, that you have uh, direct cones. So all the things that I'm going to show you after for the homogenization of electronic artificial graphene are valid also for this part. Well, Sylvain, may I ask a question here? Yes. So, but uh, previously people were speaking a lot about this photonic graphene doing some honeycomb lattices. So your point here is that you have exact mapping uh, due to the use of plasmonic components. Is that right? Yes. You have exact mapping between the two systems. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't think uh, any artificial graphene, photonic graphene was proposed like this. Uh, I think you have uh, uh, metallic uh, graphene, but it's the cylinders will be metallic. It's not. Yeah, so uh, people since 2008, maybe Haldane and Rabot, they proposed this photonic graphene uh, with uh, it's like magneto optical material. Yes. Uh, they demonstrated photonic. Uh, whole effect, photonic analog of whole effect, all, all the stuff like that. So it's it's like rather old story. You certainly know that. Uh, yes, I yes guess. it's the platform is different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. And here it's like I will show you exactly the same. Uh, I will show you the homogenization. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks. You have di much less direct Hamiltonian and all these things. Okay, so now I will start to show you how to homogenize, homogenize the, the system. So I will try first uh, calculate the effective Hamiltonian and then what I want to check if, if the band diagram is the same as uh, with the you know, microscopic theory and also if we want to see if the, the system is described by a massless Dirac Hamiltonian. So to, what I will perform is numerical homogenization close to the K point. For more details, you can see our paper here. So the first step to find the, the effective Hamiltonian is to find the microscopic wave function. Here I will use the FDFD method. So I start from the microscopic Hamiltonian I write the Schrodinger equation and to go in the frequency domain, I use the Laplace transform. So uh, why do we use the Laplace transform? If you use only a Fourier transform, you will have only these two terms. If you use a Laplace transform, you have an extra term, which is this one, which is the initial state. You can see it's psi at t equal to zero. So we want this because the homogenization needs an initial state. So it's why you, we use Laplace transform and here. What is the initial state we are going to choose? It's some plane wave with k in the relevant brilliance zone. So with k in the green brilliance zone here. So once you have the microscopic uh, equation, you can uh, solve the, your system using FDFD. So in, uh, to, to do final difference, it's much easier to have the boundary of unit cell orthogonal. So we change unit cell to perform the FDFD. So unit cell, which is twice as big as this one, but with orthogonal boundaries. We discretize the, the Maxwell equation, uh, the Schrodinger equation here. And what we obtain is the microscopic wave function. So here, I represent you this quantity. Uh, of course, in the context of uh, electronic waves, it, it has no physical meaning, but in the context of uh, photonic uh, graphene, it will be the, the uh, electric field, in the stationary region, the propagation. So once you have this microscopic wave function, we can calculate the effective Hamiltonian. Uh, in the last part, I show you the general method for frequency or time domain. Here, uh, you can, you are in the frequency domain, you can find something a, a bit much simpler. You just need to average this equation using the formula I showed you before. You will find that uh, effective Hamiltonian is just given by this. So here you see that it's quite simple to compute the effective Hamiltonian. You just need to calculate this integral. So uh, maybe here I can tell you what happened if you change the K. Basically, you can see that uh, if you change the K, you will change. Uh, so you take K uh, in other brilliant zone. You will change your microscopic wave function. It will change, I think, uh, the average. I'm not sure, in fact. But what happened, it doesn't change this quantity. What it changes is just the definition of uh, your, your, your K point, uh, of your wave vector. Oh, so ben, uh, sorry for interrupting. I've got just another question. Uh, yeah. In this approach of homogenization proposed by Mario, uh, it is necessary to introduce like external currents to distinguish frequency and spatial dispersion, because otherwise they are linked by the dispersion relation and you cannot say for sure what, what is what. But how do you solve this issue in the case of um, this effective Hamiltonian approach? Because I do not see source terms here. The source terms is this one. This is this, uh -huh. one. this is the Kronegger equation without source. Ah, uh -huh. okay. So it, in fact, because you, you can see this equation, the last one I, I wore, the band diagram. You obtain this just by putting the, the source equal to zero. Mm -hmm. So in fact, you do this so Laplace import, transform? What you do is you impose a, a, a source inside the metamaterial. Mm -hmm. like experimentally, maybe it's very difficult to do, but theoretically you can do that and you impose the space, uh, spatial variation of yes, the yes, yes. inside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, more or less clear, thanks. Okay, so once you have the effective uh, uh, Hamiltonian, you can calculate uh, the band diagram using this, this formula. So let me show you how does it look. So in this plot, I represent this function h effective minus e for a fixed uh, energy, for fixed frequency, and as a function of the wave vector close to the k point. So this uh, function of this q. I do that for different angles. 
and uh, sorry, I missed something. No, okay. So here you can see uh, this Q will vary positive and negative frequency uh, values. In gray, I represent you the ISO frequency contour of graphene. So this function H F minus E must go on at zero when Q is here and here. Well, so when Q take uh, value that are symmetric with respect to the K point, and also because this ISO frequency contour is a circular contour, it is true for any angle. So what we expect to see, it's what you see here in fact. For every angle, you can see that the curve cl cross the zero at the same point. So you have uh, isotropic contour and you can see that this, so I mark it by two, this dashed line here, those are zeros here. You can see it's symmetric with respect to zero. So in fact, you, you find that you have an isotropic band diagram. But you see immediately another thing. You see that you have strong resonances here. So what? As you can see here, this resonance depends on the angle and the, 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 the strength, uh, the, the amplitude of Q. So that depends basically on K. And in fact, you affect the Hamiltonian of a pause. In the, in, ah, sorry. You affect the Hamiltonian of pause that depends on K. So it's a manifestation of strong spatial dispersion. So this is not good. For example, if you want to plot a full band diagram with this, for certain angle, you will have the pole which goes cl very close to the zero, and uh, you will have pole zero constellation, and your band diagram will give you something crazy. So we want to avoid this, and to avoid this, we need to understand what happens. So as you can see, when this function h f minus e goes to infinity, it means that this function also goes to infinity. It means that the average is of this c average is zero. So you can write c average as an average of the periodic part of your block function. So I plot this periodic part of the block function. So this, uh, this is a complex number. So I have to divide by another complex number to ensure that it was almost real. So this is this formula. And you can see, if you look at the two sub lattices of your graphene here, you can see that the field here has opposite uh, uh, amplitude. So it's, you understand that the Psi average is zero, but this is not good. You don't want this in your homogenization. So to avoid this, there is one solution you can adopt. It's in, instead of uh, homogenizing uh, both, uh, averaging with both sub lattices, you only average, for example, one of the sub lattices. For example, you average only the blue part and independently you will average the red part. So this is the solution what we are going to adopt. It allows you to uh, build a two component formalism for the Hamiltonian, exactly as in graphene. In graphene, you know that graphene is described by a, a pseudospinal formalism where uh, the first component of the pseudospinal describes one of the sub lattice and the other component, the second sub lattice. So we want to do the same here. And to do so, we define two uh, functions, chi1 and chi2, which are one or zero. And chi1, for example, is uh, one on all the triangular uh, zone, green zone here, one here, 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 and is zero on the other, the purple zones. And K2 is the complementary, it's one on the purple zone and zero on the green ones. So once you have these two functions, you can uh, uh, transform your initial one component uh, system, Hamiltonian from a uh, Schrodinger equation into a two component one like this. So you put on the first component of your pseudo spinner, all that is related to the first sub lattice, and on the second component, all related to the second sub lattice. So, by rewriting your Schrodinger equation using this, you can obtain a two by two Schrodinger equation, where the microscopic two by two microscopic Hamiltonian is the following. So, you are able to transform a one component uh, problem into a two component problem. So now. The next step is to average this, uh, find the, the effective Hamiltonian for this system. So what happened here, we pass from one component to two components. As I told you uh, in, uh, in, the last, uh, in, the, in the last section, it, uh, to do that, you need to uh, consider one independent excitation per uh, components of your system. So in fact, what you need to do is to solve two problems. The first problem you need to solve with FDFD is the following. This part is the same as before, but now you can see that for the problem one, the excitation, the exponential part will be only on the first sub lattice. And for uh, 
the second solution, the excitation will be only on the second cell lattice. So you need to consider this excitation. After that, you find this. You can define a pseudo spinner with this solution, and you can average and find this function. So this is how you find the microscopic uh, effective Hamiltonian in this case. So let me show you uh, something maybe interesting. Is that uh, when you uh, so here I show you the solution we obtain for both excitation when you excite only the exponential on one sub lattice and on the other, and as you can see here for the example I choose you are able to excite independently each sub lattice. Here you can see that the field is ma uh, majority on one of the sub lattice and here on the second sub lattice. So once you have your uh, effective Hamiltonian, you can again calculate the band diagram. So now you have matrices, two by two matrices, so you need a determinant here. Here I represent these determinants as function of Q for different angle. And if you compare us to what you have before for the single component Hamiltonian, you see that you also have zeros that are symmetric with, uh, with respect to the origin. And you see that the zero is the same for all the angles. So you effectively have the same band diagram as before, but in this case, you can see you don't have these resonances. So in this time, the, by passing to a two by two Hamiltonian, you have a, a smooth function. This is because you average independently each sub lattice. So Sylvain, another question. So what is the general recipe to, to like guess the dimensionality of Hamiltonian? If you have, let's say, three sub lattices, does it mean that you necessarily have to deal with three I by three so. Hamiltonian? I think so, because uh, the problem is to have your average in all the unit cell, which is zero. You don't want this. So if you have uh, three sub lattices, you can have the same example, uh, same thing that we had here, if the, the field is opposite. Mm -hmm. You definitely don't want your average to, to be zero. It's some kind of, uh, it's the only case where the homogenization technique doesn't work. Mm -hmm. okay. It's like having zero field, but you don't have zero field, you have a complex field. Mm -hmm. That's clear, thanks. So with this Moose Hamiltonian right now, you can do a very nice band diagram, a usual band diagram. So here I represent here uh, for energy as function of the Q with respect to the K point. In red, you have the effective median theory and in blue, you have the plane wave meter. So obtained from the microscopic Hamiltonian and you can see that you have very uh, good agreement for all uh, angles. And you have the classical result of graphene, isotropic band diagram, zero band diagram. So this is similar to graphene. But what happened to, if you try to check if the uh, Hamiltonian is a massless Dirac Hamiltonian. So here I put you the general formula for a massless Dirac Hamiltonian in the space domain. If you go in the Fourier domain, you have to replace your derivative by this. And you can uh, compare this expression to the uh, an, a Taylor expansion of your effective Hamiltonian close to the K point. So you tell I expand, it appears K, Q, X, and Q, Y, and you see that by comparison, you see that this matrix should be uh, proportional to the sigma X matrix, and uh, this one should be proportional to the sigma Y matrices. So if you check that numerically, you will find that it's, it's not the case. You find that uh, it's not proportional to sigma X, sigma Y, in fact, your effective Hamiltonian is not equivalent to a massless direct Hamiltonian. Well, I, I, I wonder, uh, this, this should certainly depend on the choice of the basis. So if you do the unitary transformation, you can still maybe bring uh, to this Dirac uh, type yeah. form. I'm going to show you right now this. Uh -huh. Okay, sorry. In fact, you need to do that, but you also need to do another thing. In fact, what you need to do here is to link more your macroscopic formalism with the microscopic one. So I will show you, and you, you need to do this link with the microscopic probability of density. So you know that uh, when you have psi times psi uh, uh, conjugates, it gives you the probability of uh, finding the electrons. So this is a fundamental quantity you use everywhere in quantum mechanics. You can uh, also write this as for, with, with the pseudo spinner formalism like this. So now what you want to do you can calculate the average of this, you obtain this number. What you want to do is up to link the microscopic and macroscopic formalism, you would like to obtain the same number, 
but with your macroscopic uh, wave function, your average wave function. But unfortunately, it's not possible because it's not like this, because multiplication, as I told you before, in average, do not commute. So in general, it's not given by this. You, you cannot find this number directly with using these two formulas. And in fact, how to obtain this number using the macros, the average uh, pseudo spinor, you need to use, it was, it, in fact, it was demonstrated that you need to use this formula. So you can see that it depends on the effective Hamiltonian, derivative of that effective Hamiltonian. And only on the, in this case, the two quantities, this one and this one are the same. So what we are going to do next is to renormalize the average pseudo spinor so that the, once renormalized, the, these products will correspond to this one. So Sylvain, sorry for interrupting you again, just maybe a short question on this slide. So you assume that this effective Hamiltonian depends on the energy, which is like the eigenvalue, which you are looking for. So this means that you are dealing with the nonlinear eigenvalue problem. So do I understand correctly? Here, uh, okay. Nonlinear eigenvalue problem. Uh, I don't see why. Sorry. Hey, uh, so Mario, please. Uh, yes, I was saying, uh, it doesn't, it, it's not eigenvalue, so it's just, it's like the homogenization, right? So you can fix omega and k independently. Ah, oh, I, so I see, This is like your permittivity that depends on frequency, and uh, you have a derivative of the permittivity, in this case of the Hamiltonian, with respect to frequency, so it's like... Uh -huh, uh -huh. But when you when you look for the dispersion, of course, you get this complicated nonlinear eigenvalue yes. problem. But this, but this is this. just a response. It's not mm -hmm. uh, it's not related to eigenvalues. Yes. Okay. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. <laughs> so, uh, as I told you, you need to find renormalize your average to make this to make more your uh, your average method look like more uh, your microscopic problem. So. Uh, you use this formula, but in this formula, you see that uh, the, the, this, uh, this part depends on energy and frequency. You don't want this. You want something constant here. So you approximate this matrix by its value at uh, the Fermi energy and the K, uh, K point. So you have a constant value. It gives you an approximate uh, formula for the macroscopic probability of presence. And here I plot you, you the relative error you do when you take this instead of this. So you can see you have 15% of error, but small error. So then using this A0 you just defined, you can uh, renormalize your microscope, your average solo spinor like this. If you do so, you will find that the new renormalized function gives you the approximately the macroscopic and it's approximately equal to the, you link your microscopic and microscopic formalism. So the next step for this is to find a Schrodinger equation where instead of having this vector, you have the renormalized one. So you start for the Schrodinger equation in the stationary regime. So this is an eigenvalue problem uh, with the, defined with affecting Hamiltonian and your average uh, pseudo spinor. And you want to make appear this function, so you put some A0 in between, and you find a new uh, Schrodinger equation with this new Hamiltonian. So you can see new Hamiltonian, it depends on the effective Hamiltonian and of this A0 matrix. And is this new Hamiltonian a massless uh, Dirac, Dirac Hamiltonian? It's not exactly, but very close. As you can see, so we check numerically uh, what is our new Hamiltonian, and this is the expression we find when these matrices A1 and A2 are linear combination of sigma x and sigma y. And in fact, if I look, if I uh, show you the numerical values, this is very close. So the angle here phi is 60 uh, degrees, and if you look to A1 over cos phi, you should find this uh, matrix, and you see it's very close. You have one one here and a small number here. The same here. And for the imaginary part divided by this, you, you should find the imaginary part of this, so minus one, one, minus one, one, and zero here. So it's very close. So this Hamiltonian is not the Hamiltonian of graphene, but as, uh, as you mentioned before, uh, Maxime, by rotating the axis, the coordinate axis by uh, uh, an angle phi, uh, what you obtain, you obtain the, the, the new derivative of this one, and Finally, you obtain exactly the massless direct Hamiltonian. 
So you see that to obtain from for this system the massless, massless direct Hamiltonian, you need to calculate the effective Hamiltonian and then to the normalization define this. And now I arrive to the last uh, check to show you it's exactly the same. I check the microscopic wave function. So in if you the, the, the pseudo spinner I find before is exactly like in graphene, it should like in graphene correspond to states uh, uh, located. Uh, sorry, the first component should correspond to states uh, on the, to describe the states on one sublattice and the other components on the other sublattice. So if it's like in graphene, you should have this. Uh, the, here you have the angle phi because you rotated your axis. So what? What you are expecting to do if it's like in graphene, you expect to see that when you take this angle theta q as phi, 60 degrees, you expect to see uh, here one, you will obtain one, and you will see that each sublattice will have the same amplitude. So this is almost what you see here. For this angle, you see that two sublattices have the same amplitude. But uh, now, if you take theta q is equal, oh, sorry, equal to this angle 60 plus pi, this number will give you minus one and you will have uh, opposite uh, amplitude on each sublattice. And this is also what you find here. So I just show you that uh, the, 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 pseudo, um, the system uh, artificial graphene is exactly described by the same formalism as in graphene. Exactly. With the same pseudo spinal formalism, massless direct equation, and with the same meaning of the microscopic wave function. And now I reached the conclusion of my talk. So uh, we identify uh, the need for new, uh, for non-local effective medium models to uh, homogenize the complex structure like uh, metamaterials or other uh, structures. I pre uh, we present an overview of uh, this non-local effective medium that uh, describes very accurately a lot of systems and in particular it describes the propagation of the smooth part of the electron or electromagnetic uh, wave function. And finally, we apply this homogenization to artificial graphene and show that uh, this uh, artificial graphene is exactly described by the same pseudo spin of formalism lacking like graphene. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvain. So now the talk is open for questions. So if you have any, please raise your hands. So in the meantime, maybe I would start from the first one. Uh, so basically, you uh, explained how to calculate these effective bulk properties uh, in case of uh, quantum mechanical systems, how to calculate this effective Hamiltonian. But we know also from electromagnetism that boundary conditions also play a role. So in electromagnetism, you need some, sometimes additional boundary conditions, sometimes the conventional boundary conditions are modified. That's all the manifestations of, of this non-locality. So can you comment uh, how, how this is manifested in quantum mechanical case? I think it's the same. Here I did not calculate any uh, uh, transmission, I didn't consider any finite structure, but basically in electromagnetism you will need uh, additional boundary condition when you have extra waves in the material. You need to describe what this wave will uh, behave at the boundaries. So I think it depends on the, the, the modes in, of your system, but if you have more than the usual number of modes, you will need uh, to describe them at the boundaries. So you yeah. need additional boundary conditions. So we may get, the, for instance, the discontinuity of this averaged wave function somewhere, or the distinct discontinuity of the derivatives, just because this is the averaged, uh, you know, quantity. Yeah, so, that, that, that's that's an interesting aspect, maybe. For, for tunneling, let's say, if we consider some tunneling between, uh, you have a potential barrier and tunneling, and so you, you try to, to calculate this tunneling amplitude, and then, maybe these boundary conditions might play a role. Just my guess. Oh, yeah, it, 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 it might play, it play a role, it play a role. You need that, for sure. In fact, when you have spatial dispersion, the system is, I told you in the introduction, for example, you can calculate the reflection and transmission, but in the simplest case, when you have uh, extra wave, you need to find the boundary conditions. In the general case, it can be difficult. Yeah, yeah. So I see a question from Pavel. Pavel, please. Yeah, thank you, Maxim. Uh, I, I have kind of related question, but also like a pretty general. Uh, so I somehow previously benefited from non-local homogenization of say via medium, 
because uh, we did know the non-local permittivity of Y medium, we were able to put it into numerical models. We were not really simulating tiny structure of, of this, those wires. And finally, I was able to simulate quite large blocks of uh, Y medium quite quickly, numerically, and get some results. I just wonder if this homogenization for artificial graphene can be used also somehow like that. So can I, under some conditions, simulate some large object uh, made of this artificial graphene and whatever put point dipole and I will get, uh, say, radiation of this point dipole or I will be able to calculate scattering on some object or area filled by this graphene. Uh, because uh, for, for me it was kind of very, very theoretical, but I was not able to really catch how we can make some next step after that. Can we really make use of it? Uh, for particular, okay, I'm taking out this question of Maxim about boundary conditions, yeah, kind of limit, yeah, can I simulate something uh, large uh, with this theory? Yes, so here what I show you is for the infinite system, it's the eigenmodes and all this, if you want to consider a finite system, uh, you, you, of course, you can use the, the effective parameters, but uh, you will uh, have to take into account the boundaries, yes. But uh, yes, you can, okay, here to find the, the, the okay, you, you told me you already have the, the effective uh, permittivities. That's it. I, I, I basically don't need effective permittivity. I need something which I will put into the solver at the computer. And after that, I will be not really simulating local fields in artificial graphene. I will simulate in macro fields like your matter aging for different sub and so on and so forth. But I will be able to simulate something reasonably large, yeah? So get some large predictions about some distributions, which I usually cannot do because with microscopic fields, yeah, so you're always limited in simulation. Sorry, so I, cannot, I cannot hear you. You cannot do, why? It was not, uh, I cannot hear you, sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. I, uh, I mean, if you have large sample of some material and yeah. you are trying to simulate it uh, microscopically, yeah, you have very complicated local fields yes. and basically you cannot simulate whatever one square meter of this material in no way. You don't have computer power for that purpose. Ah, okay. And so what you want to do is to simulate the homogenized system. It's what you want to do. Yes, yes, exactly. We are homogenizing okay. in order to solve this. I'm asking you if you can give me some example, then this homogenization, uh, which you kind of proposed and developed, can oh. help me. I think Ma Mario did some uh, FD FDTD, FDT, with FDTD, you can... Yeah, for example, FDTD, yeah. I, just again, as an example, Mario knows this very well. With, with Y medium, sometimes... You can probably calculate this in, uh, with FDTD, uh, some uh, propagation in graphene super lattices, but I think it's also... Oh yeah, this is exactly what I wanted. Yeah, what, what is it? So it's a graphene, oh, I have the presentation of Mario, but it's a graphene super lattices, like the one I show you, but you, in, in top of the graphene, you put uh, um, potential on a large, uh, on several uh, wavelengths. Ah, sorry. I will try you to show you this, maybe. In, the, in this simulation, you have uh, an initial state uh, that very slow in space, and uh, you compute the time evolution with the exact Hamiltonian, this is on the right, and with the effective Hamiltonian, which is on the left. And I mean, essentially in this, case, we see that the effective Hamiltonian predicts well the time evolution. Mm -hmm. so this is one example. But, but by the way, for the, for the structure that, uh, that Sylvain described, Sylvain, we did this for a super lens, right? So you consider the interfaces in that case. Yes, but uh, yes, yes. So in that but case, yeah. we used... Uh, yes, we use, but here you, we don't have extra waves. So it's, we but we have interfaces, right? Yes, yes. Yes, so we use the, the model to 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 predict uh, some specific defect, and it works fairly well. I mean, it's not perfect, but it works. It's not perfect lens, but uh, uh, it uh, it it works reasonably well. 
I wonder is it is this technique is constrained just to, to the specific initial conditions because you mentioned that you have to choose initial conditions which more or less coincide with this averaged wave function which might be not the case in some real let's say problems. I think you can expand after that you 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 real um, sorry your real excitation into some kind of pin waves. Yeah, yeah, but still, you will have this uh, large K contribution. Oh, you cannot, the effective light, I mean, as you can see here, you have some small variation here in the wave function. You will not have this in the, 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 the parts varying rapidly in space are, are, are lost in the effective light on the average. And then I maybe a bit develop this question from Pavel. So uh, do you anticipate that this technique can help us in describing some solid state problems? We have a lot of atoms. So we have, of course, this, all these packages for solving Schrodinger equation numerically. So can we somehow uh, simplify the things with the help of this technique? Mario, Mario has a lot, uh, to, lot of articles on this. It's uh, homogenized some semiconductors, superlattices, uh, even some, some uh, some simple semiconductor, Berg semiconductor, yeah. homogenized, defined by the Hamiltonian and the analytic expression, uh, all this. So you can you can apply this to graphene, uh, so, uh, super lattices, uh, and semiconductor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thanks. So I see the question from Mikhail. Uh, Mikhail, please. Uh, yes, hi everyone, and uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, just wondering, because I'm not really well into this area, uh, of course, what you describe is a two-dimensional system, but when it comes to artificial implementations, that probably a particular case, you could consider propagation perpendicular to wire medium, and uh, you maybe make some variation to that, and probably that has been done. Uh, now, what happens if... Uh, you change uh, propagation away from that plane. Is that a sharp and abrupt change immediately? Or it's more like a smooth transition? Like, are there any interesting effects associated with the deviation from a strictly two-dimensional problem in this situation? In the situation of graphene you, you're talking about? Uh, no, if, if you uh, imitate so, that artificial structure by, by using uh, a grid, grid of wires, for instance. Yeah, you can also consider uh, every di direction. In fact, you can see we have uh, this nice paper here of uh, the homogenization of wire medium. And uh, what we obtain at the end, it's uh, analytic formulas for the, it's not numerical. Sorry, it's here, this paper. We obtain an analytical uh, formulas that were already obtained. And we also derived for a case that was not derived. No, 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 yes, yes, this is clear, but that's uh, like the, the background theory, but, but specifically in the context when you want to emulate graphene-like features for this propagation, is there anything okay, interesting but, which yeah, happens we for that consider this of, Because we consider only the 2D propagation. In the case, for example, of the, we simulate, uh, for example, the artificial, the photonic one, but we put some peg plates on top of it, so we cannot have deviation for the of the 3D propagation, so I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, but that probably that could be an interesting story. Well, I'm not sure, but... But uh, maybe with graphene, uh, I don't know. Because here, if you have peg, you cannot couple nothing in, in the perpendicular direction. Uh, uh, Sylvain, uh, I think what, what Misha is asking, that actually like, uh, yeah, you, you, you have 2D system, but also uh, perpendicular to this, you may uh, put some wave number variation or something like that. Yeah. You'll easily put this in all your formulas. Right now, phase variation in perpendicular to the plane which we see is zero. Yes. Uh, we just wonder if we can put some wave number there, yeah, along that direction. And will this somehow affect other things? So probably graphene will be not no more graphene and the band will be destroyed. This is what Misha is asking. Do you know? Yes, yes, thank you, Paolo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, I didn't know that. But uh, yes, here we cannot, do, we cannot impose, uh, in this system it's electronic, so you cannot go out of the plane. The electron needs uh, some matter and this is uh, 
located in between packs, so you cannot uh, you cannot check this with this system directly. Well, mm -hmm. Slovenia, because you have these systems bilayer graphene, and which, which is very hot topic nowadays. So you have two graphene layers which are rotated one with respect to each other, and people are publishing nature after nature on, on that topic. So can we apply this machinery uh, to these systems? You mean to, you're talking about specific system here? Yeah, let's say bilayer graphene. Yeah. Sorry, no, you but, can't. Have. I don't think you can have because it's it's closed system. Uh, we also uh, consider some points on uh, periodic arrangement in the z direction make the same. The, the wave vector will be for sure in the plane. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I don't think you can check that with this system. Yeah. Okay, we'll see. So, any other questions, colleagues? Any comments? Maybe the, the last short question, when, when, when you showed us uh, the comparison of plane wave expansion versus uh, this effective Hamiltonian technique. Uh, so you, you have this slide somewhere close to the end. So I wonder whether... Uh, this one? Where, yeah, where the, no, no, not this one, but you, you had this comparison, just bent diagrams, just bent diagrams. Okay, okay, I see what you mean. Yeah, and uh, I wonder whether... Huh? Some, maybe lower. So you showed us, yeah, these Dirac cones, and you see that there is some discrepancy. I wonder what is the reason for that, because you mentioned previously that this uh, effective Hamiltonian approach in, uh, okay, okay. gives you exact band structure. It's, it's exact, it's exact. It's just, you have a numerical Hamiltonian. So to be able to calculate the band diagram, you need to do some Taylor expansion. Mm -hmm. You do the Taylor expansion goes to this point. So you can see in the middle, it's exactly the same. Ah, so you, so you expand the effective Hamiltonian in terms yeah, of... It's numerical, you need, to, you need to make a pair of SQ here. Uh -huh. Okay, so you expand uh, this effective Hamiltonian and in powers... Effective Hamiltonian, it appears Q, X, Q, or Q, and after <laughs> that I can solve. Exactly. Ah, so you cannot solve without this expansion. Uh, it's difficult. Yeah, that, that's the nonlinear eigenvalue problem we were discussing. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you so much. Very nice talk, very interesting. So thanks for joining us and thanks for very interesting discussion.